This video was made with support from my patrons, whose names are on screen now. If you want to, you can join them today and even get access to exclusive content. The link to my Patreon is in the description, so check it out if you're interested. Anyway, on with the show. There is no shortage of strange and unusual race cars that have competed in events from all over the world. From the unusual practicality of the Volvo 850 and Peugeot 806, to the experimental ideas of the Delta Wing, Chaparral 2J, or GTR LM Nismo, really anything is possible in the world of motorsports. In some quarters, Japan's Super GT series has become well known solely for its unusual cars that couldn't be found racing in any other series in the world at the time. In most cases, these were either cars entered privately by smaller teams, or one-off prototypes that were developed independently from any major manufacturers. There was, however, one big exception. The Honda HSV 010 GT took the Super GT series by storm when it debuted in 2010, and since then has become something of a cult legend. A very mysterious machine that seemed to disappear almost as quickly as it materialised, virtually nothing about the HSV's story or design could be described as traditional. And despite that, in some ways this car is quite emblematic of Honda as a whole. The legacy of the HSV extends much further than simply the four seasons in which it competed, and in this video I'm going to explain it all. This is the full story of the HSV and Honda in Super GT. If there's one thing that you should know about Honda, it's that they don't care much for convention. Really, you just need to take a look at their major milestones to understand this. They started producing motorcycles in 1955, entered Grand Prix racing in 1959, and by 1961 had already taken wins at the Isle of Man TT, the toughest and most prestigious road race there was. And if this was impressive, their achievements on four wheels surely must have been mind-blowing. They designed and built their first four-wheeled vehicle in 1963, the Honda T360 K-Truck. But within the same year, they then produced the S500, arguably one of the greatest sports cars ever made. The next year, they entered the Formula One World Championship as a fully-fledged constructor building their own engine and chassis. At the time, they were one of the only teams to do this, along with a little-known constructor by the name of Ferrari. But at the Mexican Grand Prix in 1965, they achieved something that even Ferrari couldn't do that year. They won. American driver Richie Ginther took Honda's first Formula One victory in only their 11th race. And really, those were just the origins of Honda's many successes in motorsports. But from this description, you might make the judgement that Honda is near unstoppable, and can achieve almost anything when they put their mind to it. But this isn't entirely true, because rejecting convention is a double-edged sword. Honda has to be one of the most experimental companies you'll find among the major manufacturers. They do things entirely their own way. Through this, they have achieved some incredible innovations, such as the much lauded VTEC system that manages to improve engine performance, crucially without sacrificing fuel efficiency. But even though Honda has innovated in many ways over the years, not all of their ideas are winners. For example, Honda's oval pistons that appeared in its NR series of bikes, or their RA302 F1 machine that had its chassis skinned in magnesium. Both of these were solid ideas in concept, but in reality weren't able to achieve what was envisioned. The latter of course had far more dire consequences, and was even one of the major reasons why Honda left Formula One for the first time. Anyway, all of this should be sufficient groundwork for explaining Honda's tenure in Super GT, and how the HSV-010 came to be. Of course, the first official Super GT season, then known as the All Japan GT Championship, took place in 1994. But when the ragtag group of cars assembled for round one of the championship at Fuji on the 1st of May, there were no Hondas present, and there would continue to not be any until 1996. When one did first appear, fielded by Team Kunimitsu, it was actually the 1995 Le Mans winning Honda NSX GT2. 
but as the car was entered into the top GT500 class, it was underpowered compared to its rivals from Nissan, Toyota and McLaren. The all-star driver lineup of team owner Kunimitsu Takahashi and Keiichi Tsuchiya could only manage a best finish of 7th across the year. But for 1997, Honda would commit to producing its own purpose-built GT500 NSX, and this would be introduced in round 2 at Fuji. It has to be said that it wasn't the most glorious debut, as the two cars that were entered from Kunimitsu and Mugen Dome both retired after accidents within the first couple of laps. But things got better as the season went on, with Mugen Dome achieving Honda's first pole position in round 5 at Mine, and the Kunimitsu car achieving the first podium in that same event. But even still, you could argue that Honda was competing with one arm tied behind its back in 1997, as they only fielded two cars. Compare this with Toyota, which had up to six Supras competing at each event. For 1998, the Honda stable doubled to four cars, with Dobin Mugen expanding to run two separate cars, and Nakajima Racing entering the fold. 1998 would be a breakout season for Honda that truly established the three-way fight with Nissan and Toyota that the series has become synonymous with. In an unbelievable record that still stands to this day, Honda took pole position and the fastest lap at every single race. Seven in total, and eight if you include the non-championship All-Star race. They also won four of them, five including the All-Star race, making them easily the most dominant force that year. And yet, despite all of this, it was not a Honda that claimed the title, but the Pennzoil Nismo GTR. And there was one major reason for this. Reliability. The NSX quickly developed a reputation for being fast but fragile, and this is ultimately what cost any of the Honda teams being able to win the championship. It was a similar story in 1999, where Honda once again took more victories than Nissan, but still couldn't seal the deal. If there was a silver lining though, their two wins at the start of the season meant that they had achieved six consecutive GT500 victories, a record that once again has never, and may never, be beaten. However, in a complete reversal of form, the 2000 championship would be decided in Honda's favour through sheer consistency. Ryo Mishigami took the GT500 title for Mugen after scoring points in every single race of the season, including four second places and zero wins. Yep, Honda's first GT500 title came from a winless season. But in that respect, the Castrol Mugen car was an outlier, as Dome, Nakajima Racing, and even Honda newcomers ARTA all scored victories with the updated 2000 NSX GT. 2001 was another strong year for Honda, with both the defending champion Mugen car and number 8 ARTA machine heading to the season finale with a strong shot at the title. At around half race distance, they were running in 6th and 7th places respectively. But, with the championship leading AU Surumo Supra way down the order after a spin on the opening lap, the title was now Honda's to lose. And so, here's how they lost it. The Autobax car retired on the spot, and the Mugen car was left to limp home in 12th place with damage. In 2002, the car received a facelift and scored an impressive 5 wins during the season, but yet again couldn't achieve the title, with Nakajima Racing coming within a single point. 2003 was not a great year for Honda. New regulations were introduced, allowing for more flexibility in the design of the car, but the NSX struggled for balance. Even so, they still managed two wins, but the best-placed Honda team was only 7th in the championship. For 2004, Honda made a major change to the NSX. They decided to replace their naturally aspirated C32B engine with a smaller turbocharged C30A. This would prove ill-fated, as the unit was difficult to cool and so couldn't be run to its full potential. Nakajima Racing was the only remotely competitive Honda team, scoring a victory in the wet at Motegi and finishing 8th in the standings. And so, partway through 2005, they reverted back to the C32B. In 2005, they would also build this, 
the Honda NSX R GT. This road car was built as a homologation special for the GT500 machine. As such, its extended front and rear overhangs, as well as roof air intake, served little to no actual purpose on the road car, but allowed for greater aerodynamic freedom with the race car. As a result of these changes, the 2005 GT500 NSX was a much more competitive package than in the previous two years, with ARTA finishing as the runner-up in the standings. 2006 was also very strong, with the Takata Dome NSX being ranked third and the Raybrig NSX second, missing out on the title by just a single point. If it weren't for a drive through penalty in the finale after contact with the Zanavi Z, it most likely would have been champion. But after so many near misses, 2007 would finally be the year. Five race wins, a top four lockout in the championship, and the winning team sewing up with a whole race to spare. It was a complete dismantling of the opposition. The years of experimentation had finally paid off. This was the NSX GT in its ultimate form. For 2008, the car was hit with a 50kg handicap as a result of its crushing domination the previous year, and so was never quite as competitive. Dome did manage to take a victory at Sugo, a circuit where the mid-engine NSX was always strong, and finished fifth in the overall standings. But in 2009 came another major regulation change in GT500. Along with a unified engine formula, one of the rules mandated only allowed the use of front-engine vehicles. This meant that the NSX would no longer be eligible. The issue for Honda was that they didn't have a suitable road car to act as a basis for a new front-engine GT500. In the end, a compromise was made, and the NSX was allowed to compete for just one more season. Of course, by this point, the road-going NSX hadn't been produced since 2005, with the GT500 car still based on the NSX R GT. So regardless of these regulations, the NSX's days were numbered, and so 2009 would be the car's swan song. ARTA scored two wins en route to second in the championship, including the final round at Honda-owned Twin Ring Motegi. It wasn't quite the title, but still not a bad way to send off what was the then-longest-serving GT500 car. 106 races, 50 pole positions, 37 race wins, and two drivers' championships. A detuned GT500 NSX even competed in GT300 for a few seasons, winning the title in 2004 with the MTech squad. So, it's safe to say that its successor had some very big shoes to fill. Anything less than exceptional would have been viewed as a disappointment. But even by the end of the 2009 season, it was still unknown what Honda was planning to do. The Honda HSV 010 GT was revealed to the world on the 21st of December 2009 as Honda's all-new GT500 race car. But what exactly was it? Clearly it wasn't based on any Honda road car. So after the NSX ended production in 2005, the plan for its successor was already in place. They had already previewed a potential successor as far back as 2003 with the HSC prototype, but it wouldn't be until 2007 that things became clearer. In June of that year, a modified Honda S2000 was seen lapping the Nürburgring. The car was clearly stretched, had a fixed roof, and a unique exhaust setup. Almost immediately, there was speculation of this being a test mule for the next NSX. This sort of thing isn't uncommon in the motor industry. For example, an Infiniti G35 Coupe with altered bodywork was also seen at the Nürburgring back in 2005, which was used for development of the Nissan R35 GTR. Ultimately, it was announced in December 2007 that Honda was intending to produce the second-generation NSX by 2010, with styling based on the Acura ASCC concept car that was shown earlier in the year. This confirmed one key detail about the car. It was going to be front-engined. This brought it in line with Toyota's planned Lexus LFA, a car that would have been seen as one of its natural rivals along with the GTR. But another aspect that would have been similar to the LFA was to do with the engine itself. 
Honda was planning to use a 5 litre V10 unit, as previewed on the ASCC, mated to an all-wheel drive system. By 2008, a more representative prototype was again spied at the Nürburgring, clocking in lap times around the 7 minute and 40 second region. But then in September, just as things were starting to heat up, came the financial crisis, and the automotive industry was hit hard. Even the largest and most profitable companies were having to make cuts, and Honda was no exception. They sold off their works Formula 1 team on the eve of the 2009 season, but even still, more had to be done. They simply couldn't justify the cost of the new NSX, and so it was announced in December 2008 that the project had been cancelled. It was reported that this was a very unpopular decision within the Honda R&D department. Given just how much time and effort had been poured into the project by this point, to can it completely just seemed cruel. And not only that, but it left Honda without a flagship sports car. But not all hope was lost. Because with Honda needing to replace the NSX in Super GT, it was decided that what had been developed for the new NSX would be fed into producing the brand's next GT500 Challenger. And thus, the HSV 010 GT was born. HSV stands for Honda Sports Velocity, not Honda's strangest vehicle. I don't know where you get that idea from. But anyway, comparing it to the prototype NSX scene at the Nürburgring, you can clearly see the similarities. It's funny to think that the only result of the new NSX being cancelled, in terms of Super GT, was the car's name, as had it been made, it almost certainly would have been used in GT500 as the new NSX instead. But that still leaves the question of how the HSV was allowed to race in the first place, given that GT500 cars had to be based on production models. Well, Honda was able to sidestep this requirement by instead claiming that whilst it wasn't based on a production model, it was a production-ready model, as stipulated in the Super GT rules. This, if anything, does highlight just how far in development the new NSX was. I mean, not as if Super GT had much of a choice anyway. It was either this, give the old NSX exemption for another season, or lose Honda from GT500 altogether. So that's how the HSV got to Super GT, but the story doesn't end there. The HSV 010 isn't talked about outside of Japan very often, but if there is one thing you're likely to know about it already, then it's probably this. The noise that this car makes is something else, especially when compared to its more conventional rivals in the form of the Nissan GTR and Lexus SC430. Many have likened it to the V8 Formula 1 cars from back in the day, but I'd argue that it sounds even better. There have been some misconceptions that this car was powered by a V10 engine, however this isn't true. It was always a 3.4 litre V8, as mandated by the GT500 rules at the time. But given the sound, and the fact that the road car was intended to have a V10, I guess that's not too surprising. Also, the name HSV010 doesn't help matters either. In reality, the reason for its glorious sound is to do with the decision to funnel all eight cylinders through a single centre-mounted exhaust, and of course its HR10 EG engine that was heavily based on the one Honda used in Formula Nippon. But with all of that covered, we can now finally talk about the HSV's racing exploits. The car debuted in round one at Suzuka and made an instant impression. The Wida HSV, run by Dome, took pole position at the hands of Takashi Kagure, but on the first lap of the race, he ran wide at 130R on a damp track and slipped into the pack. Then, on lap 11, whilst battling with the ARTA and Epson HSVs, this happened. <laughs> Both the Wida and ARTA cars retired on the spot, with the Epson HSV that was caught in the sandwich falling out of contention after having to make repairs. Still, the NSX didn't exactly have a glorious start in the series either, and the silver lining was that the Raybrig car was able to finish a respectable third place. 
It's worth noting that one of the drivers of the Raybrig HSV was Naoki Yamamoto in his first ever Super GT race, and he would go on to play quite an important role for Honda in the years to come. Round 2 of the season took place at Okayama International, and once again, the Wida HSV started from pole. Fortunately, this time round, it was a far more straightforward race for Kogure and teammate Loic Duval, with them leading from start to finish, resulting in the first ever victory for the HSV. Being mid-engined, the old Honda NSX was always the outlier in GT500, compared to its front-engined rivals from Nissan and Toyota. This resulted in a car that had different strengths and weaknesses. At times, it was capable of completely crushing the opposition, and other times it was absolutely nowhere. The HSV being front-engined meant that it was a lot less likely to experience these wild swings in performance relative to the opposition, but it did still carry over a few traits from the NSX. Sportsland Sugo was always a very strong track for the NSX as it favoured a good weight balance, but the HSV, with its impressive downforce, also ran well here. Sugo was round 5 of the 2010 season, and the Hondas showed speed by having 4 of their 5 cars qualify in the top 7 positions. But interestingly, it would be the Kahin HSV, which started from 10th, that would have the biggest starring role. It gradually made up places through the race, until with only a few laps to go when it reached the race-leading Wida car. Kogure fought to hold off Kudai Sukakoshi, but as is tradition at Sugo, it was always going to come down to the final lap. In the closest ever Super GT finish, Sukakoshi snatched the victory for Keihin Real Racing, their first ever in the series. It had only competed in a handful of races at this point, but the HSV was already involved in some pretty memorable moments. For round 6, the series returned to Suzuka for a 700km race, with Honda hoping to banish the memories of round 1. The ARTA HSV started from pole position, but lost out to the Motul GTR in the first round of pit stops. As it turned out, they wouldn't need to fight too hard to get back in the lead, as the GTR was spun out by a GT300 car. In the end, it would be a fairly simple victory for ARTA, but the race wasn't without its drama for the HSVs, with the Epson car losing a wheel at its final pit stop, but still finishing in 7th. Having scored a win and two further podiums, it was the Wida HSV that would head into the season finale at Motegi as the title favourite. Once again, they would qualify on pole, but they had their main championship rival, in the form of the Enios Lexus, starting right behind them. The stage was set for an almighty showdown, but unfortunately, the battle was decided before it even started. Bjorn Wordheim, who started the Lexus, had ignored a red light at the end of the pit lane when leaving the garage to head onto the grid. For this, the team was given a 20 second stop and go penalty. This took the pressure off the Weeder squad, but they still had to finish the race. After ceding the lead to the Petronas Tom's Lexus, at least not without putting up a fight, they would come home in second to seal the GT500 championship in the HSV's debut year. This was only Honda's third GT500 title, but maybe the most impressive given that it was done with a completely brand new car that nobody even knew existed until less than a year beforehand. Honda would continue with the HSV into 2011. The first race took place at Fuji in torrential rain, with the best HSV coming home in just 8th place. The car never performed amazingly in wet conditions, but a big part of that was down to an external factor. You see, Super GT has always had an open tyre war with multiple different makers supplying rubber to each team. As told by the joint 2010 champion, Loic Duval, 2011 was the year when Michelin really came into their own in GT500. Their tyres were generally good, but in extreme conditions, like when it was really hot or really wet, they seemed to have an edge over the three other suppliers, Yokohama, Dunlop and Bridgestone. 
Unfortunately for Honda, none of their HSVs ran Michelin tyres, and at least according to Duval, this was a major disadvantage when compared to Nissan and Toyota, who each had a car on the French rubber. Regardless, this didn't deter Honda from trying. Next time out at Okayama, a win was within their grasp. The Wida HSV led the race until it came in for its pit stop at the end of lap 33. But a bizarre issue with the seat belts when doing the driver change caused them to lose a heap of time and plummet down the order. Then the Keihin HSV took over the mantle and challenged the leading Calsonic GTR. But a misjudged overtake resulted in a drive through penalty, wrecking their chances also. In round 3 at Malaysia, the Wida took pole, and in a repeat of Okayama the previous year, stormed to a dominant victory. Once again, the potential of the HSV was clear to see. In round 5 at Suzuka, the HSV once again won, and once again it was the Wida car. After a DNF in the previous round at Sugo, they bounced back with a very strong drive in mixed conditions to put themselves firmly in title contention. Of course, the race still wasn't without drama for the other Hondas. There was never a dull moment with the HSV. Ultimately, Honda lacked consistency in 2011, and it would be Nissan's Michelin team, s Road Mola, that would take the championship in dominant fashion. They only won a single race that year, but finished second in four more. The Wida would end up third in the standings, albeit a whopping 33 points down on the winners. 2012 started with yet another near miss at Okayama. The Raybrig HSV took the lead after the pit stops, but was passed by the Zent Lexus in dramatic fashion on the final lap. To be frank, 2012 was the HSV's worst season by some way. It says a lot when its two most notable moments were losing the lead just before the finish, and also Tsukakoshi's massive accidents at the Suzuka 1000. That said, there was one bright spot at Sepang, where the Wida car did a replay of their 2011 performance by taking pole position and leading the race from start to finish. This was Honda's only victory of the season. In the championship, it would be the Raybrig HSV that would finish as the top Honda in fifth finally overcoming the Wida car by just three points, but still a massive 50 behind the Mola GTR, which again stormed to the title. For 2013, Honda decided to make some changes. The most obvious was with the exhaust system. Instead of the single centre-mounted tailpipe that the car had always used, they redesigned it so that there would be two side exit exhausts, one on each side. This arrangement allowed the car to rev higher, although it wasn't as much of a screamer as it used to be. The season would start strongly at Okayama. In the dying laps, both the Raybrig and Keihin HSVs were right on the tail of the race-leading Motul GTR. As the Raybrig car finally found a way through, that opened the door for the Keihin as well, and both cars were practically glued to each other to the flag, starting the season with a 1-2 finish for Honda. Round 4 at Sugo was another iconic race in the HSV story, both for good and for bad. Four Hondas qualifying in the top seven places once again showed its affinity for this track, but it would be the events of lap 70 that would leave a lasting impression. The Wida and Raybrig HSVs were firmly in the hunt to take the win, but remember the almighty sandwich from the car's debut back in 2010? Well, it happened again. Both the Wida and Raybrig cars were out on the spot, and a few laps later, the Denso Lexus also succumbed to the damage. This left the keeper Tom's Lexus in the lead, but not for long, because only a few corners later, the ARTA Honda dived down the inside to snatch it away. And after closing out the final few laps, they took a truly unexpected victory alongside the ARTA CRZ, which had just won in GT300 also. ARTA was one of Honda's most prolific teams in the NSX era, 
but the HSV years were a struggle for them. They finished dead last in the 2012 standings, so nobody begrudged them a bit of good fortune in securing this memorable win. Wida would bounce back at Suzuka, where they would claim another win after passing the pole-starting Motul GTR on lap 116. This would be the HSV's third win in four years at the Suzuka Endurance Round. Heading into the final race at Motegi, both the Wida and Keihin HSVs had the chance to claim the title, but they had to overcome both the Petronas and Zent Lexus SC430. As it turned out, it was the Cahan car, which hadn't won a race all season, that would be the more competitive of the two Hondas. They would qualify second and finish in second as well, but unfortunately, third place was all the Zent Lexus needed to seal the title. And that would be the end of the HSV story. It was announced for 2014 that Super GT would start to merge its technical regulations with DTM, the German Touring Car Championship. The formula that was adopted in 2009 of 3.4 litre naturally aspirated V8 engines would be replaced with 2 litre turbocharged 4 cylinders. Also, the dimensions of the cars would be altered, taking on a more boxy touring car style, thus requiring all new designs. This meant that after just 4 years of service, the HSV-010 would be sent into an early retirement. For a car that was meant to serve as merely a stopgap solution, it sure did leave a lasting impact. In more ways than one. It has to be said that despite the HSV being this unicorn of a car, that sure didn't come across in the way they raced it. They crashed a lot of them. In fact, aside from winning races, crashing is what they spent most of their time doing. But this is Super GT, so I guess you could say that about most other cars. I really do love the HSV. It's just so quintessentially Honda, outside of the box thinking at its finest. Many people were left frustrated by Honda's decision to not put it into production, but I'm honestly just grateful that we got to see it in Super GT at all. Think about it this way, Toyota did end up producing the LFA, in spite of the 2008 financial crash, but they never raced it in Super GT instead sticking with the SC430 that ended production in 2010. I mean, could you imagine a GT500 LFA? But despite Honda not producing their spiritual LFA rival, they did eventually race it. To me, these two cars directly complement each other in a weird way. But as I said at the start of this video, the HSV is emblematic of Honda as a whole. And when we take a look at Honda in Super GT, post HSV, things somehow get even stranger. The second generation NSX was first seen in January 2012 at the Detroit Auto Show. Dubbed the NSX NC1, this car was designed completely from scratch, with virtually nothing carried over from their previous attempt. It was a mid-engined, all-wheel drive, hybrid supercar. Although the car looked close to finished, it would take four more years before it would finally end up in production. In the meantime, Honda still needed a car to compete in GT500 for the new 2014 regulations. And so what they did was once again lean on the production-ready clause of the GT500 rulebook. In August 2013, the Honda NSX Concept GT was shown off for the first time, featuring a mid-mounted 2.0-litre turbocharged 4-cylinder engine. Of course, the main difference between this car and the HSV was that this NSX would eventually be made. It was also mid-engined, just like the original NSX. From 2014, mid-engined cars were once again permitted in GT500, at least initially. And something else that set it apart from the Nissan GTR and new Lexus RCF in GT500 was its hybrid system. Just like the NSX road car, the NSX Concept GT had its engine twinned with a hybrid powertrain to give it additional power. In fact, this makes it the first, and so far only, GT500 car to be a hybrid. Once again, it was just another example of Honda doing something different. Anyway, in that first season, the car achieved a single win in round 5 at Fuji with Wida. 
This wasn't entirely representative though, since the race took place in torrential rain, and most of the Hondas were light on ballast due to poor results in the prior races. Although Wida Dome would finish 4th in the 2014 championship, no other Honda team even cracked the top 10. One of the biggest problems with the car was the additional weight of the hybrid system, that simply wasn't offset by the increased power. So for 2015, the car was permitted to run slightly lighter. Even still, it was somewhat off the pace of the Nissan and Lexus, but Team Kunimitsu did bag a win at usual Honda hunting ground Sugo. They would finish the season in third overall, 19 points adrift of the title-winning Nismo squad. But after 2015, Honda decided that having the hybrid system was no longer worth the trouble, so they ditched it for 2016. Sadly, this didn't result in the upturn in form they were hoping for. No longer having that hybrid boost put on full display the lack of power from the HR414E engine, with Honda failing to win a single race for the first time since 1997, when it officially joined the series. The best ranked Honda team was 11th, and across 5 cars they only achieved 3 podiums in total. For 2017, a completely new car was introduced, although it didn't look very different to the old one. The road-going NSX had finally entered production the previous year, so Honda updated their GT500 car in accordance, no longer basing it on the prototype model. Even so, the season got off to possibly the worst start imaginable at Okayama. First, the Keihin NSX failed to fire up on the formation lap. Then, the ARTA NSX also died before the race even started. With two NSXs littering the circuit, the start was aborted, but even as the cars were forming up again on the grid, the Epson NSX also crawled to a stop. And when the race did eventually get underway, the Raybrig NSX gave up after only six laps. The one NSX that didn't encounter issues was the Motel Mugen car, which came home in ninth. Thankfully, this wouldn't be an omen for the rest of the season, as Honda's performance was much improved, partially thanks to some technology that they derived from Formula 1. Pre-chamber ignition was first used by Ferrari in 2015, but Honda was the first to implement it in Super GT on their new HR417E engine. This helped to make up for their power deficit from the previous year, and allowed ARTA to take victory in round 5 at Fuji, and most memorably, the Epson NSX to take a shock victory at the Suzuka 1000km. But really, 2017 was just a setup for 2018, the year that Honda finally retook the crown after 8 long years. Honda achieved 4 wins this year, and it would be the squad that brought the brand into the series in the first place, Team Kunimitsu, that sealed the championship. It's incredible to think that it took the new NSX 5 seasons to do something that the HSV achieved in its first. But in 2019, it was formally announced that Super GT and DTM would be fully unified under a common rule set known as Class 1. This is what both series had been working towards for a number of years, but there was just one problem. The NSX. Both the Nissan and Lexus GT500 cars shared a common monocoque with the DTM cars, whereas the one in the NSX was slightly different, owing to the engine being mounted behind it. For complete parity to be achieved, all of the cars would have to be front engine. This meant that 2019 would be the last season that the mid-engine NSX would be eligible. Its form wasn't as strong as the previous year, but they also suffered a fair amount of bad luck as well. The only victory was for ARTA in the season opener, and Keihin Real Racing would be ranked as the top team in 6th overall. When it came to the DTM tie-up, this took two forms. First, one car from each of the three GT500 manufacturers was entered into the DTM finale at Hockenheim. This makes the NSX the only mid-engine car to ever compete in the DTM prior to its GT3 era. The second was known as the Super GT DTM Dream Race, which took place at Fuji Speedway. This was a two-heat event with one driver per car. Six DTM cars, three from BMW and three from Audi, made the journey over to compete. 
Of course, the second race would be the final time that the mid-engined NSX would ever compete in GT500. But it was also the final race for the Lexus LC500, which was being replaced by the new Toyota Supra for 2020. So, to send the Lexus off, they decided to crash all of them into each other. Bold choice, Honda on the other hand took the far more conventional decision of trying to win the race. And they would achieve this with the Modulo sponsored Nakajima racing car. And who was the driver to give the mid-engine NSX its final ever win? Well, none other than Narain Kartikeyan. Yes, THE Narain Kartikeyan. Amongst a field of some of the best drivers from Japan and Europe, Narain Kartikeyan. You know, I think I know why they call this the dream race, because whenever you think about it, it just sounds like a weird fever dream. But I swear this really did happen, look it up. Anyway, for 2020, Honda needed to bring a front-engine car for the new regulations, very similar to the situation that they found themselves in 10 years prior. So what did they do? Maybe come up with a successor to the HSV? Nope, they took the NSX and put the engine in the front. That was it. A simple solution for a simple problem. And the thing is that they had thought of this before. Back in 2008, just before the new GT500 regulations were about to come in, Honda trialled a front-engine version of their existing NSX. You can tell from the different proportions and lack of air intake on the roof that the engine is clearly in the front. But ultimately, they decided against it and went with the HSV instead. I assume this was done because the NSX was already a 5 year old design at that point, and there was no real reason to continue since they didn't even sell the car anymore. But after being shelved for a couple of years, the front engine NSX was seen once again at post season testing at Motegi in 2010. Initially, many were confused by this, since the HSV-010 had already debuted and even took the title, but it soon became clear. The NSX was being used as a testing mule for KERS, Kinetic Energy Recovery System. Super GT were looking to test this system that was already seen in Formula 1, to potentially introduce it in a future season. This NSX was chosen specifically because it represented a car that fit the current regulations, and yet it didn't give Honda an unfair advantage with additional testing miles, as they had no intention to race it. Also, it was agreed that all of the data gathered from it would be shared with Nissan and Toyota as well. Of course, KERS was never used in Super GT, but hybrid systems were, so in some way, this NSX does have a tangible link to the NSX Concept GT that was introduced in 2014. Anyway, much like the HSV, when the front-engined NSX finally debuted in 2020, it was instantly on the pace. Keihin took the car's first win in round 2 at Fuji, and this was followed by three more wins for the car throughout the season. In the end, Team Kunimitsu would once again claim the title, their second in three years, in dramatic style at the final round, and there would be three Honda teams in the top five positions in the championship. In fact, they even achieved a top five lockout in round seven at Motegi. The front-engine NSX had arrived. 2021 was also a very strong year, with four wins across the season and three Honda teams in the top six in the championship. But in the season finale at Fuji, Karma would repay Team Kunimitsu the favour from the previous year. With the Stanley car running fifth, and in prime position to take a third title in four years, they were wiped out by a GT300 NSX. That's just how it goes sometimes. For 2022, Honda produced an updated NSX Type S road car, the final iteration of the model, and the GT500 machine was updated to reflect this. It was another solid year, with both the Stanley and Astemo NSXs staying in title contention right to the final race, but Nissan were just too strong with their new Z. And that brings us neatly to 2023, the most recent season as of now. This was a difficult season to judge, because the NSX showed good pace, but there were simply too many mistakes made, both from the drivers and the teams. In the end, the top Honda was the number 16 ARTA in 4th place, 36 points down on the winning Tom's team. And here we are now in current day. 
Once again, Honda find themselves in the position of needing to change their car for the 2024 season, but this time by their own choice at least. Really, when you boil it all down, Honda being the oddball in GT500 all stems from one key fact. They've never made a proper front-engine sports car. The only thing that really came close was the S2000, but that was a roadster, and Honda never really viewed that model as a pure performance car. Hence why it never received a Type R variant or was ever used in Super GT. So, what choice did Honda have when it came to replacing the outgoing NSX GT? Well, it was announced in early 2023 that a successor had been decided. And here it is, the Honda Civic Type R GT500. This was kind of shocking when it was first announced, for obvious reasons, but the more I think about it, the more this starts to make sense. The Civic Type R was introduced back in the 90s, but as time has gone on, the car has steadily grown into what it is today, in its latest FL5 iteration. In essence, the Civic Type R of today is a high-performance front-engine sports car that just so happens to also be a practical front-wheel drive hatchback. When you put it in those terms, frankly it seems like the obvious choice. The GT500 regulations have permitted four-door cars for more than a decade, but the Civic will be the first. Of course, to meet regulations, this Civic has been converted to rear-wheel drive, so it's not exactly a perfect solution. But with the second-generation NSX now dead, the Civic Type R is without a doubt Honda's flagship performance model. And when the 2024 season gets underway at Okayama on the 14th of April, I can't wait to see what Honda can achieve with it. I've now made a number of videos about Super GT, but there's something that I've never really talked about before. My allegiance. So, you might have worked it out by now, but I support Honda. Really, any of the Honda teams, but more specifically Team Mugen, who currently run both the number 8 and number 16 Autobac sponsored cars. When observing Honda's story in Super GT, I think it becomes obvious why I find them so fascinating. Because whether they're winning or losing, they're always doing something interesting. Using a midship car, designing a new engine that they'd only use for one season, racing the first hybrid in GT500, bringing in engine tech from F1, completely redesigning their car to put the engine in the front, and now using a front-wheel drive hatchback as the basis for one of the fastest GT cars on the planet. There's really never a dull moment with Honda in Super GT, and I think the HSV-010 is the ultimate summation of all of that. A stillborn supercar being used to create a racer that would represent the brand in the biggest domestic championship, where it would go on to win races and even a title, surely has to be some of Honda's finest work. Super GT is due to introduce a new GT500 rule set in 2025 ditching the outgoing Class 1 regs. Aside from those few races in 2019, Super GT never crossed over with DTM again. Both BMW and Audi leaving the series at the end of 2020 meant they were left with no choice but to scrap their Class 1 cars, and switch over to the far more cost-effective GT3 formula. Ultimately, the tie-up between Super GT and DTM that began in 2014 is the reason why the HSV had to be killed off in the first place. But through Class 1, we were again able to see yet more Honda ingenuity. I look forward to seeing what new possibilities come from the new regulations, and doubtless I'll be keeping a keen eye on one brand in particular. The only way that Honda can achieve true greatness is by doing what only Honda can do.